my lord's uh, my lady I, I represent the appellant in this film uh, with my lord's friend Ms Davis uh, my lord's friend Mr Watson represents the respondent who I'm delighted to say as of yesterday is a richly deserved QC so mm, many first. congratulations <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> <you>. <laughs> this first case is a QC I'm um, sure that squires will put you through your <laughs> your paces <and> so. <laughs> um, you should have one further document on the desk where we, we've missed out one part of one of the PSIs which we need. It should, it should be one, just one page. Yes. Um, which I think can go in the back of tab 20, another Annex X. You've got Annex O at the back of tab 20 of the authorities part. Twenty, so the, literally just go at the very end. It's another got annex O is the last document at the moment. This is annex X from the same PSI. Yes. Um, in terms of the order of submission, subject to the court to you, I've discussed this with my learned friend. Do you have our appeal, and you also have a respondent's notice, um, a set of issues from the Secretary of State. And, uh, and what we propose, subject to the court's view, is that I'd open the appeal dealing with our our appeal, the, the justification issue. Um, my learned friend would then respond to that and uh, open on uh, ambit and status. I would then uh, reply to that and reply on, on justification. I appreciate it does have some jumping up and down, but it may be easier. No, that's, than, that's, um, that's fine. Can I just say, Mr Watson, Mr Squires, that we've read everything. Um, there's been quite a lot to read. Um, um, can we thank you both and your teams for all the hard work you've clearly put into this uh, case, um, um, particularly in relation to all the, the highways and byways of the law? Um, um, so you could feel free to highlight your main points um, and articulate the, the sense of the, the main structure of your your arguments. Take us to everything you want us to, to focus on. Um, but we, we're pretty up to speed. Um, okay. Thank you, Mark. I'm grateful for the, the, the indication. So I, I, I was going to start on uh, justification, perhaps just by uh, encapsulating what our case is on that at the outset. Yes. Um, and essentially, our objection is to the blanket rule. Uh, in uh, Rule 7 1A introduced in 2014, um, which means that from 2014, there's an absolute bar on all appeal rights exhausted, ARE, foreign nationals, for being considered uh, for open conditions. So even if they're a very low risk, even if they benefit very considerably um, from transfer to open, they can't be considered, and the Secretary of State has no power to transfer them to open conditions. So even if he thinks he'll be desirable have this prisoner tested in open conditions to see if on tariff expiry they can be released. He has no power now to transfer them. And the justification for the bar, in essence, is that most ARE prisoners are presumed suitable for removal from the UK on tariff expiry. And so it said they don't have a need for open conditions in order to establish that their risk is reduced. But it's not disputed that the appellant is not one of those prisoners. He is not presumed suitable for removal at tariff expiry. And it's not disputed that for him, he will need to establish risk reduction in order to be released. And we'll see the numbers, but it looks like it's something like 5 to 10% of the ARE prisoners fall within that category, or at least are not released on tariff expiry. The numbers are pretty small. It looks like it's about 20 lifers a year, and it looks like one or two are not removed on tariff expiry. Now, we accept that it will certainly be justified in an individual case for the Secretary of State to say, well, very likely this person will be removed on tariff expiry, doesn't need open conditions, I won't transfer him. We also accept, and this is perhaps the heart of the case, that as the Secretary of State does for other prisoners, he will be entitled to say, I'm only going to consider ARI, ARE prisoners for transfer in exceptional circumstances, particularly if 
they're not presumed suitable for transfer. And that would deal with any concerns about transferring prisoners to open conditions who may not need to be there because they're going to be removed on tariff expiry. But it would mean that for a prisoner like the appellant, who does have the same need for open conditions as any other prisoner, they could at least be considered to see if they were suitable. And that, we say, is the heart of the case, subject to us being right on ambit and status. In our case, it's not necessary to have an absolute bar on considering any ARE prisoners for transfer. We say it's not proportionate for the Secretary of State to retain no power at all to transfer a suitable prisoner. So that's the, the justification argument in a nutshell, and I'll seek to expand, expand yes. on that. Um, I was going to turn next to the, the legal and policy framework, but uh, given my Lord's indication that um, you've at least had a chance to look through the documents, and it's covered very thoroughly in the, the Divisional Court's judgment below, it's paragraph 7 to 43. And what I was intending to do is just to make, uh, I think, six points about uh, the legal policy framework, and then two very short points uh, about, about the facts. Um, first, on the legal and policy framework, is on the re regime governing release of life sentence prisoners in general, and foreign national prisoners in particular. Uh, it's dealt with in the judgment at 12 to 22. Um, all life sentence prisoners can be released under Section 28 of the Crime Sentences Act 1997. Once they've completed their tariff, they have a right to be considered by the, to have their case referred to the parole board. And if the parole board directs their release, the Secretary of State has to release them. And the test is the very well known test. It's in uh, 28.5b of the 1997 Act, satisfied no longer necessary for the protection of the public for them to be detained. And the process for that consideration, it set out um, or the PSI that was applicable, which is the one we've been looking at, is 22-2015. And the process effectively starts 26 weeks before tariff expiry, with the idea that at tariff expiry, the parole board, or shortly after the parole board, can consider whether the prisoner still needs to be detained. Just remind me which paragraph in the judgment you refer to. It's at uh, 12 to 22 sets out the... Um, for prisoners liable for removal from the UK, so this is uh, appeal rights exhausted prisoners who are lifers, uh, they can be released under section, or I should say removed from prison under section 32A of the 1997 Act. This is dealt with in the judgment at 23 to 28. And this is a discretion of the Secretary of State to remove from prison in order to deport anyone who is effectively appealed rights exhausted. And that applies to the appellant. His tariff expires 29th of September this year, 2021. And at that date, he will be eligible for release at the direction of the parole board and also removal from prison and deportation at the discretion of the Secretary of State. Either way, the outcome is the same. Either way, you end up being removed from prison and deported. Uh, second point, um, many, if not most, ARE lifers will be presumed suitable for removal under Section 32A, under what's called TERS, the Tariff Expired Removal Scheme. But as we'll see, we'll look at the numbers later on, it looks like about perhaps 5% are not presumed suitable. and. The judgment sets out at paragraph 27 the section from the PSI as to who and who isn't presumed suitable. And you have the, the PSI itself is at 275 of the supplementary bundle. But in essence, there are a number of different categories, people with confiscation orders against them, outstanding criminal charge, removal would undermine the confidence of the public in the criminal justice system, and then uh, the one that's relevant to us is terrorism, terrorism offenders. 
they're not presumed suitable for removal. They may not be. Uh, well, they may not be. They may not be um, removed. They're not presumed suitable. The way in which the structure yes. works is that everyone is presumed suitable unless you fit into one of these categories. So there's a sort of, and that's why again, when we come to the what we say with the ease of having an exceptional circumstances policy, is you know exactly who is in presumed suitable and presumed unsuitable. You you, you immediately will know who at least is presumed suitable. And you know that this person does not fall within that category. So you are going to have to give, give thought to what is going to happen to him. And the, 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 the effect of that provision is for the Secretary of State to reserve <clears throat> to him or herself the, the, the decision. Uh, yes. I mean, I suppose he, in, in a sense, he, he always has the discretion under 32A. It's a broad discretion. But the way his policy works is he has um, everyone presumed suitable for removal at tariff expiry, and then a group, I think it's five different categories who are not presumed suitable. And we'll see again why that would make any sort of exceptional circumstances policy pretty easy to administer. Um, third point <coughs> is that for the appellant, whether his removal is considered under Section 28 by the Parole Board or Section 32A by the Secretary of State for Justice, they'll be engaged in essentially the same exercise, which is an assessment of his risk. And that is because the terrorism category, um, the reason that they're not presumed suitable is concerns about risk of terrorism. And so the Secretary of State considers what is the risk, what is the nature of the terrorist threat, if any, this person poses. And it may be easy just to see where the Divisional Court sets out the, the relevant paragraph from Dr. Bennett. He was the Secretary of State's witness uh, statement. It's at um, paragraph 28 of the judgment, page 87 of the <coughs> Court Bundle. And you see it's the, the end of paragraph 28. That's the... It was said there, you, you see it's, it's on page 87 where the quotation is, you said there at, at this stage there was no um, terrorism offender who'd yet been considered for a TERS, no doubt, because they have, tend to have long, um, long tariffs, though I think there has now been one. But anyway, the, the policy, how one considers it, is set out by Dr Bennett, and it's, it's a, one looks at the terrorist, does this person pose a terrorist threat? And that essentially is a risk-based assessment. That's the same thing the parole board would be considering under Section 28. Presumably look at the person's conduct in prison. Have they done courses? Have they, do they maintain connections with extremists? Have they said extremist things, etc.? Fourth point. For any life sentence prisoner who does need to establish risk reduction in order to be released. Time spent in open conditions is likely to be of real importance to them. Um, that's recognised, it's recognised in a number of authorities, but perhaps the, the, the clearest one which sets out the position is, is Ryder and the Lord Chancellor, which you have at tab, um, tab 9. I don't know if you need to, to turn it up. Um, there's the divisional court confirmed that for many life sentence prisoners, time spent in open conditions is a necessary precondition to release. It's not a, a legal requirement and it's not a de facto requirement. What, what it said in Ryder is that 15% of lifers are, um, are released directly from closed conditions. 85% go through open conditions. This is for life. The Life divisional percent. court flagged up the importance yes. or the relevance of this, didn't they? Yes, they did. Uh, they did, and we said it's not, and it's not surprising that open conditions are so important for establishing um, risk reduction, because it, it essentially, and there was no great dispute about what the experience is for prisoners in open conditions. It's set out in 
you know, when Oxley turned up, but Mr. Godala, who was the appellant's, who was the appellant's list as witness statement, paragraphs 18 to 24, uh, page 44 through 3 of the supplementary bundle. But in essence, um, uh, I suppose they, they are what they say on the tin. They're, they're open prisons. Prisons spend, or the idea is that prisons will spend mu much of their time during the day outside of a prison working on courses, etc. Um, and you can obviously see why that is so important in testing risks, because however many courses a prisoner has done in closed conditions, however they've reacted when faced with other prisoners or, or prison staff, a real test, especially if they spent a long time in prison, and this, the appellant, it's a 17 and a half year tariff, so it's a long period of time he would have spent. To see whether his risk is really reduced, you want to see how he responds to the temptations, risks, possibilities of real life, of, of the world on the outside. Mr Squires, it's at, <clears throat> I'm not asking you to turn it up, it's actually 41 of the judgment of the Divisional Court where they take an extract from Dr Bennett's statement, which in summary sets out what the transfer to open conditions can provide. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes, it's, it's particularly you get the chance for, for ROTL, for, for yes. leave, and so that. Um, and simply to acclimatise to life outside and communication with others and the ability to lead a life. Um, it, but it's correct, that, that has all, all of those benefits, but in terms of the primary purpose of it, um, the primary purpose, certainly for lifers, is said to be testing. It's seeing how they react. And it might help just to turn that up. Um, in the um, PSI 22-2015, um, page 70 of the supplementary bundle, um, it, my lady's right, it has, it has a series of benefits, but certainly for lifers, the, the purpose is, certainly the main purpose, set out paragraph 7.9. Court will see that the, the purpose of open conditions, that first line, is to give the prisoner, this is talking about indeterminate sentence prisoners, so lifers and IPP prisoners, the opportunity to test the progress made during the time... So where are you reading from? Sorry. At 7.9, the first line, the purpose of open conditions. It's just that line. Sorry, page. page 70 of the supplementary bundle. Mr Squires, it, it's not entirely straightforward. We have two separate numbers in our supplementary bundle. Ah. Oh. Uh, at the bottom, it's the numbers the bottom, on the, it's the bottom. Number. Apologies, yes, the, 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 inter, the top ones are the internal yes. numbering. I apologise. Yes. yes, it's the it's the numbers on the bottom of the what the reference I'll give you. Yes, it's the internal number so seven, but it's seventy of the, um, and it's seven point nine. It's the the purpose of open conditions. Can you explain to me, Mr. Squires, who drafts the PSI and what the purpose of it is? These are the Secretary of State, they're drafted by the Secretary of State, as I understand it, and they're the, the Secretary of State's policies. And so who, does it, who does it go to? Who's it, it goes, if, if you look at the, the front page 32 of this one, and you'll see it's, so it's, issue, it's, a, you see it's issued on the authority of, this is um, NOMS, National Offender Management Service Agency Board, it's a part of the MOJ, and then you'll see this particular one goes to public sector prisons, contracted prisons, non. You see whoever's cross there. I think looks like it's. Thank you. Um, so, so that's the the purpose of open conditions, as far as uh, lifers uh, or another ISP prisoners are concerned in indeterminate in sentence prisoners. And we'll see in a moment when we look at the. Uh, directions given to the parole board by the Secretary of State as to what it should consider whether it, when it decides whether to recommend someone for open conditions, that the key question it asks in terms of benefit to the prisoner is about testing. It's about testing this prisoner. There's a whole set of concerns about risk, but in terms of the benefit or the purpose of open, it's, it's about testing. And that led to the conclusions, as um, my lord, uh, or just Haddon Cave said to me, about the, the importance of open conditions uh, for, pris for lifers in general, and this, pri this prison in particular, in the 
divisional court's judgment, just to flag up the paragraphs. Before you do, Squires, you, you said a couple of times that it was this the primary purpose. Was your phrase? Yeah. My, my lady put to you that there's a basket of drift. Where do we find emphasis that it's the primary? Purpose? Well, well, perhaps I'd, I'd go further. The only one in any of the Secretary of State's policy documents, the only purpose it gives is testing. So that's why we say it's the primary purpose. The, that's the one, the only one I think we've been able to find in any of the documents when it describes its purpose is... Test the progress made during the time spent in closed conditions and from undertaking offending behaviour work. Yes. So you're testing. That's what in closed conditions. We'll see this in a moment when we look at the directions given to the parole board. Closed is where you, you do offender work. You then test the progress you've made in open. So that's the purpose. And the reason I say primary purpose, in fact, it's certainly the only purpose when we look at the Secretary of State's documents. But you accept, as my lady has suggested, that there are other purposes, family, integration, all those other issues that are canvassed. Uh, my, my Lord, yes, I suppose what I would say, there's certainly other benefits to prisoners of, of being out, but certainly when, in, in as, far as, purpose, as far as purpose is concerned, the only one that is examined by certainly the parole board when it considers, should I send this person to open or not, the benefit that's identified, again, we'll see, it's testing. But so, but my, my Lord, I, I accept there will certainly be other benefits to prisoners of open conditions, but in terms of what we say at least is the primary purpose, it's, it's testing risk. But of course, I accept that people will be able to see their family more. That would apply to this particular appellant. Well, uh, this comes from Dr. Bennett's witness statement. The primary purpose, he's, he's talking about ROTL, but that is implicit in, in the open regime. The primary purpose of ROTL is to help offenders prepare for the resettlement in the community in the UK. Um, but it is, and, and one submission that I will make shortly, if I can make it now, is that um, the only time that purposes of open conditions are set out other than testing is in relation to this case. None of the other documents from the Secretary of State that we have found, all his policy documents, um, only refer to the purpose of testing. See. These other purposes, we do find, my lady's absolutely right, in the witness statement here and in some of the documents seeking to justify Rule 71A. But outside that, all of the policy documents that we've been able to find from the Secretary of State does not identify that purpose. The purpose they identify is, is testing. And that's why I took you to the, that was about the clearest indication of it. And I'll say I'll take you in a moment to the directions given to the parole board. Um, in terms of the the impact for prisoners, again, it may just to flag up that the key parts in the judgment, which I know, the judgment below, which I know the court will have looked at. Um, but it, it's paragraph 29. Are you on your point four still or point five? I'm in my point four still. It was just, it was the, it was the importance of open conditions, which I think you. is not in order to uh, secure release. Uh, paragraph 29 of the divisional court judgment. And this is when they say, as we've explained, they, they go through paragraph 11, um, how ROTL works, etc. And then they say, progress can be assessed, not available in closed, short-term release. For many ISP prisoners, the transfer advocates would therefore be important, if not vital, showing that risk has reduced. And then get a similar conclusion at paragraph 34, important, if not essential step. And then, in the discussion of AMBIT, that's applied to this particular appellant, generally and to this appellant at 72, out of 72, uh, Romans 7 and 8, page 102. And you see towards the end of the paragraph, again, evidence is clear. This is from the whole punch below and down. Prisoners may be released, prospects... No paragraph? At 72, uh, Little Roman 7. It's just the part from the, the whole punch to the end of that paragraph. It explains why he has an interest in being considered. Um, 
point to number five is that for all non-ARE prisoners, and what was the position for ARE prisoners before 2014, there is a step-by-step -step process to consider whether an indeterminate sentence prisoner is suitable for open conditions. It's quite a careful and case-by-case -case process. And the position is that no prisoner has an automatic right to be transferred to open conditions. Indeed, there's not even the presumption that anyone will be suitable. In each case, there's a balancing exercise that's conducted. And as I say, it's a three-stage process. The first one is a sift, or a filter, of the Secretary of State, which is three years before tariff expiry, he will consider indeterminate sentence prisoners and ask himself whether there's a reasonable prospect of the parole board recommending their transfer to open conditions. It may be easier to just turn up the document. It's, it's supplementary bundle page 60. It's back, back to the same PSI we are in before, which is a few pages earlier. And it's first two paragraphs there, 4.1, 4.2. Pre-tariff ISPs eligible to have their case referred to the parole board up to three years before the expiry of their tariff to consider recommendation for open. And you'll see the Secretary of State operates a filtering process. So he decides whether there's a reasonable prospect of the board making a positive recommendation. If not, that's the end of the matter. If he thinks there is a reasonable prospect of the board recommending open conditions, the matter is referred to the parole board, and the policy the parole board adopts is that set out 31 to 32 of the judgment below. Just pausing there, if the Secretary of State decides no, then that, that is the end of the matter. Yeah. So it's purely down to the Secretary of State's yeah. discretion. Yes. And we'll see, that, and, then, and his discretion comes in again at the next, at a third stage, but yes, entirely. I mean, subject to judicial review, but I mean, yes, it's a entirely discretion if he thinks no reasonable prospect. Is, is that relevant in looking at the overall context of, of what we're considering here? That in any event, the Secretary of State um, has control? A absolutely, Michael, because that, that's one of, our, one of our points, again, back to the suggestion of why one would not uh, retain that control in relation to this relatively small category of case. And it also means that, for example, an exceptional circumstances filter, and we'll see there are others in other contexts, will be pretty easy to operate. The Secretary of State would look at it and think, well, you're, you're going to be removed on tariff expiry. There's no re reasonable prospect of the board recommending you for open. That's the end of the matter. It's not, it's not an open-ended discretion under paragraph 4.2. The discretion is to consider whether there's a reasonable prospect yeah. of the parole board saying yes. No, no, my, my lord is absolutely right. That's the, the, the policy is to apply it in, in, that, in that way. We'll see there is a, a much more open-ended discretion at the back end to reject the parole board's recommendation. But no, my lord is right. It's a, the test that the Secretary of State sets himself is reasonable prospects. So can I just be pedantic on this one? So that is the decision made in the order of three years before tariff expiry. Yes. You say that really is a no subject to judicial review. Yes. When on the next occasion would the Secretary of State have an opportunity to consider um, 
any transfer or movement of a prisoner, if at all. To open? Yep. Can I check? I think there is bits in the policy where one comes, yes, come back to back, it, but comes back to it. But I'll see. We'll see if we can find. And I'm pretty sure it's in that policy, but I'm not. I'm not sure off the, yep. the top of my head uh, when it is. And, and just all... taking the point on, then, um, Mr. Squires, just picking up on the latter point that you were making, as I understand it, the essence of it is that there is this discretion. And if, for example, there wasn't an absolute bar, but a discretion where there was certain guidance in respect of certain groupings of prisoners, that really would reduce the number of prisoners who, in fact, would have to be considered and ultimately transferred. Is that uh, the yes. essence of it? Yes. Um, and so when one's doing the proportionality analysis, yes. one of the things we look at is, well, what would the resource implications be, yes. et cetera? So, um, and one of the things here, they would be, um, I mean, the numbers are pretty small, as we'll see anyway, but this mm. would certainly reduce very significantly because if, if it is the case that the majority are simply presumed suitable, one would have thought that would be an entirely judicial review proof decision if the Secretary of State said, well, there's no reasonable prospects of you being um, recommended uh, release because you're presumed suitable for removal, a tariff expiry, you don't need open conditions. So that's the first stage of the analysis, the, the 4.1, 4.2. If there are reasonable prospects, um, the case is then uh, sent to the parole board under uh, section 2392 of the Criminal Justice Act. Uh, and that's going to be important for AMBIT because what the Secretary of State has the power to do is to ask the, the parole board for advice uh, if a matter is to do with early release. That's the language of section 2392. Um, and the parole board then has the power to give advice. And this is clearly a matter that's to do with early release because it makes it significantly easier for a prisoner to be released. So the Secretary of State has the power to ask the parole board for advice and the parole board to give it. Um, he then sets out, the Secretary of State then has a policy which is set out paragraphs 31 to 32 of the judgment below. And it's also at the end of tab 20. Um, but if, if you, whichever is easier to, to pick up. So say very, very end of the authorities bundle or paragraphs 31 and 32 of the judgment. Uh, and what you'll see from that, paragraph one is that the, the introductory paragraphs can be beneficial for ISPs, period and open can be beneficial. And again, well, this will come back to the point about benefits and, and what the identified purpose is, particularly for beneficial, as it gives you the chance of resettlement leave. Not necessarily, this I'm reading paragraph two, not necessarily in every case, absolutely right, to have spent time in open conditions. And then this, the main facilities, intervention, and resources for addressing and reducing core risk factors exist principally in the closed prison estate. So that's where you do the courses. The focus of open conditions is to test the efficacy of such risk reduction work and address, where possible, any residual aspects of risk. That's the, the focus of open conditions. And then you'll see paragraph five to seven is the, the test. And it's a balance of risk and benefit. But as the divisional court said, very much with a focus on, on risk. So there's a whole series of different things the parole board has to consider. What risk of absconding, trustworthy, etc. in seven. And then you balance that against the benefit, which is the 7D. And again, the benefit, and this is why, again, I go back to the point about what the, the, per, the primary purpose of open. The benefit you look at is being able to address areas of concern and to be tested in the open conditions environment, such as to suggest that a transfer to open conditions is worthwhile at this stage. And that, of course, is why this is all being done three years prior to tariff expiry, because that's you can then be transferred, say, two years before. Um, my lady, I've handed a helpful note. It says it's paragraph four point two five, page sixty three. This is the um, the further pre the further reviews of, Thank of you trans. Very much indeed. Um, so that's the that's the next stage. So I say it's it's a balance of risk and benefit. It's not it's not like a decision 
in relation to release, where one is only looking at risk, as the Division of Court explains in paragraph 33, it's a balance with the focus on risk and the benefit, and you see what the benefit that's identified is, addressing concern and being tested. And of course, that's not only a benefit to the prisoner, but for society more generally, because, and in fact this applies in particular with prisoners who are the Secretary of State wants to deport, because the quicker you're able to test someone, the more likely you are to be able to say, well, this person doesn't still need to be in prison, we can release them in the community, their tariff has expired, and in the case of an ARE prisoner, they can be removed from the country, which is the Secretary of State's primary aim. Um, there's then a third stage, and which is that this is only a recommendation, unlike a release direction. The Secretary of State doesn't have to comply with the recommendation, and he has, um, and here it is a very broad discretion, to reject the recommendation. It's um, when it, it's back to the same PSI. I don't think you need to turn it up, but it's page 67, paragraph 6.4, he has a residual discretion to reject a recommendation where he does not consider there is a wholly persuasive case for transferring the prisoner to open conditions. There's also a stage at which other people are able to object, to reject it, but the Secretary of State, that's, a, that's his discretion, so if he thinks it's not wholly persuasive, he can reject, so that's a, again, a very, that is a broad discretion. So that's the three-stage process that applies to everyone else, and I said it did apply to ARE prisoners pre-2014. Um, sixth and, and final point is the position of AR or ARE prisoners is they're completely barred from that process, and they're not treated like a series of different other categories of prisoners who can be considered for open conditions, but only in exceptional circumstances. So there are a range of other policies the Secretary of State has by which prisoners will not be considered by the parole board at all, recommended for open conditions, except in exceptional circumstances. And I can, again, I can, I think maybe without, I can just give you the references to the documents. Um, but some examples of those are if, if, a, if a prisoner is um, in category A, they've got proven adjudications for serious, serious violence within the last 12 months, they're presumed unsuitable for open conditions. That's supplementary bundle, page 61, paragraph 4.12. Can you just give us, again, we just need to make note of these references? Uh, Supplementary bundle, page 61, yes. paragraph 4.12. This is back in the PSI we've been looking at. 4.12. Proven adjudication for serious violence the last 12 months. Category A, I think there's a number of others. Um, but it still makes clear they're not automatically excluded. But there needs to be exceptional circumstances. Another category, and it may be easy just to turn, turn these up, so it's page 77, this is in the same document, 77 in the supplementary bundle. So th these are prisoners with a history of abscond or escape. Paragraph 10 of the PSI. So you'll see this applies if prisoners have absconded or attempted to abscond from open conditions, failed to return from leave, convicted of a criminal offence which took place while on leave, attempted to escape an escort. Again, they're presumed unsuitable, but there may be exceptional circumstances, and you'll see there there's the exceptional circumstances test. And again, you'll see one of the key ones is providing evidence of reduced risk. Particular, which they can't do in other conditions. So that's 
Um, and another category, and this is, uh, for, for your reference, this is Annex O to the PSI, which is, I'm sorry to be moving around, this is the end of tab 20 of the authority bundle. This is prisoners who are liable for deportation. Can we just open it up first? Of course. Okay. Just give us yes. a bit of time. Thank you. Paragraph 20 of the authority bundle. This is the authorities bundle. Yes, I right? uh, Tab 20 of the authorities right. bundle. It's Annex O. Mm -hmm. of, it's actually Annex O of the same document we yep. were in, but it's, unfortunately, I apologise, it's in a different bundle. Um, and what you'll see at paragraph 8, there's the internal number in page 109, is prisoners with ARE are ineligible entirely, but... Those who are liable for deportation but not appeal rights exhausted can still be considered, but, and then there's again a series oh, of. Sorry, where are you reading from? At paragraph 8. Yes. Uh, it's page 109 of the internal numbering, which is the number at the top. Yes. Um, paragraph 8, you'll see. You've just summarised. Can you just tell us precisely what you're reading from? Uh, paragraph 8. Can you read it? Oh, yes, certainly. Pursuant to prison rules, the ISP who has been served with a deportation order and who has exhausted all uh, in country appeal rights. Is, in, is ineligible to be considered for open conditions. An ISP who is liable for deportation but does not meet the criteria set out above, um, i.e. they're not appeal rights exhausted, can still be considered for transfer to open conditions. However, and then there's, they have to be a very low abscond risk. Yeah. And there's various other tests there. So say, we'll come back to submissions on justification, but the question will be, is what is the justification for not having one of these forms of exceptional category for ARE prisoners such as the appellant. Um, Your essential point is that these are all safeguards which could have been left in place. That's your point. Yes, precisely. And so that's and that's what what has to be justified is not putting them in place and having the absolute bar. That is yeah. what... That's, that, that's what the case is, in a sense, yeah. the, the heart of your case. Precisely, yeah. yes. Um, that, those are my um, six headline points on the, the um, legal and policy uh, framework. Um, two uh, very brief factual uh, points. Um, one is, uh, as we saw in the judgment, it's not disputed that for um, this particular prisoner, and in fact, it's what was found by the divisional court. He is likely to gain significantly from time in open conditions because he does have to establish risk reduction, and he's not presumed suitable for removal under uh, under TERS. Uh, second point: so this prisoner is likely to benefit. Is yes, it, yes, from it's open the, because yeah. um, because he does have to establish risk reduction in order to be released, whether it's by the Secretary of State or by. Parole board. They're both looking at terrorist threat. So we saw, we saw that finding in the divisional court judgment. Um, second, it's not disputed that the appellant may be of sufficiently low risk to be considered suitable for open conditions. And um, you see at paragraph 27 of our skeleton, we refer to his co defendants. Um, who are not liable for removal, but who've got exactly the same sentence and who've actually progressed more slowly in their sentence. He, he was actually moved pretty quickly for a terrorism prison to cat category B in 2014, category C in 2016. They progress a lot more slowly, but both their cases have been referred to the parole board, at least to consider transfer to open conditions. So there's every reason to believe. Is it right, Mr. Squires, that we need to look at this case not just in relation to the instant appellant, but since more broadly, since it was a policy decision. But, but, but my lord, absolutely. But again, that comes back to the exceptional circumstances category, because it is, if you then have particular individuals, that's what it enables you to do, is to move them to open, um, if you retain the discretion. But, but my lord is right, it's 
Um, and, and that's where we'll look at. It is going to be important to look at the figures, how many people this affects. Indeed, um, but one can't test this case simply on the facts of this particular. They're relevant, of course, yeah. if you rely on them, but it has to be looked at more broadly. But we'll accept that, and we'll, we'll certainly that's when one starts to look at what the balance is. What what one place on one side of the balance is the impact on this individual. But when one then sees the benefits, one looks at well, the policy is a general one. What are the benefits of having a policy framed in this way, which is absolute? Then that's precisely what we'll look at. So, um, and you say our case is a very good example yeah. of why. This was... Precisely why one would have the exception. But 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 also, I will look at the. The, the overall picture. Mrs. Um, Wise, before you move away from the facts, can I get one clear? Has the appellant embarked on the progression regime? Um, no, the, the position is he was, um, he applied for, I think, the main one at Warren Hill and was told Good. it's only foreign nationals. Yes. Um, two yeah. others were, were very far away from his family. He mm -hmm. applied, I think, I'll, I'll check the position, the factual one. He did apply for a, a Oh, uh, another one and was accepted, but um, his offender manager advised him that actually it probably wouldn't make a difference to him because the prison he was in, um, for a closed prison, he had a fair amount of freedom and actually it wouldn't be very different in a progression regime. But I think what, um, what I think his offender manager told him is that actually he'd be better off having staff that he knows where he is now writing reports about him. So, um, um, yeah, so, so t turning to, um, turning to the, ju the justification um, argument, um, um, make two introductory points before I turn to the, our, our grounds of appeal. As I say, what has to be justified is the absolute bar, the, the entire removal of the discretion, not having a policy, not any decision in individual cases. And... Um, Ordinarily, if a decision maker was to say, um, to have a policy which says, I am never going to consider exercising my discretion in, this, in relation to this category of case, if that was in a PSI, that would be clearly unlawful. That would be an obvious fettering of discretion. A decision maker can't say, you're entitled to say, I'd only exercise it in exceptional cases, but you can't say in a policy, well, this category I'll never consider. The reason we don't have that simple answer here is you have the somewhat unusual case in which the Secretary of State is both the decision maker making decisions under the rules and the person who makes the rules. Second, and as far as we know, this is a unique feature of this case, and we haven't found any other is that the difference in treatment the Secretary of State has to justify arises from a decision to remove from himself a very broad discretion that he had. And part of the reason that there may not be other cases that have considered this, that it would take, we say, quite a striking set of facts for it to be justified to remove a power from yourself in that way, that the simple answer if you don't want to exercise a power, is not to exercise it, rather than to say, I'm now going to bar myself from ever exercising and from my successors exercising it. Is that right? If you don't exercise a power, you may be open to judicial review. If you refuse to consider exercising it, you would. But if you decide in a particular... Well, what's the difference? Um, uh, well, so if you... Um, if you were to say, what would be, and this was my first point, if you were to say, I'm never going to consider this category of case as a policy, that would be unlawful, it would be fettering of discretion. But um, provided you say, well, I will consider cases, even if it's on an exceptional basis, that would, that would be lawful. The question is here is, what is the harm by the Secretary of State having the power? whether or not he exercises it, but simply having, possessing the power to make the transfer. That's what has to be justified. But in, in other areas of government, it may be decided that a particular discretion or area of decision-making um, is, for one reason or another, too much like hard work. Yeah. Uh, and to, 
uh, too resource intensive. So a bright line is drawn, those are carved out. Is, is that particularly unusual? Well, my, my Lord, um, I mean, well, you, you have your point, yes. which we completely understand that the scale of this, you say, is rather very small. And therefore, what's the rationale for it? It's not too much trouble. But looking at it more broadly, it's perfectly understandable, isn't it? In, in the sense of governmental um, context of, of carving out decisions and saying, right, we're going to have a bright line for that particular. My Lord is right. I no, no, absolutely. And, and, and in fact, that predicts into one of my, the, the, the main submissions I'll come on to in relation to ground two is precisely that, is there are circumstances where, and there's a, there's a series of cases that consider the justification for a bright line. And we say that uh, that is ultimately what the analysis ought to be here. That's what has to be justified is the bright line. I suppose all I was, the, the only point about unusualness is that generally speaking, um, it's, um, someone is imposing a bright line on someone else because rather than on themselves. But well, it, it, why does that make in principle any difference? It may be the person who, who, who makes the rules and who has the is in a better position to say, right, this area of administration um, is, is something that needs to be just uh, dealt with. Uh, yeah, but my, my Lord, my right. There, there, were, there were two observations, I suppose. It's partly just that we haven't come across other cases of this sort. But, but I certainly, we do say that one of the key points, and my Lord is absolutely right, there are a series of cases and circumstances where one, the justification for why you have some people who may fall on the wrong side of a line is we just need a bright line. And what you then have to justify is the bright line. So I'll, I'll come on to that, because we do say that is key to our submission. That, that is what the Secretary of State needs to justify, is the absolute bright line. One of the interesting things about administrative law and public law in the last 30 years is that the number of bright lines <laughs> seems to get less and less. They're all nuanced um, um, with um, sub rules and distinguishing this sort of test from that sort of test. But, but, but my Lord is right, my Lord is right and, I, and, I, and I say what one of the, the issues will be what are the disadvantages of having there are obvious advantages of bright lines and, and that's also I will, I will grapple with that because that is we say key to this case because our submission will be this and I'll come on to it this simply isn't a case where there is where even a justification has been put forward on, a, on the usual bright line basis which is this is this will be too difficult to administer an exceptional circumstances test or whatever it is it is just for administrative reasons, that's the normal argument, and I'll come on to it. Our submission is it, it hasn't been put forward in that way, and we say unsurprising when one looks at both the numbers and the nature of the scheme. Uh, and, and perhaps the, the simplest point, which I'll come on to it, is normally um, you have a bright line between two groups. You say, well, you do get you get the benefit if you can satisfy these conditions. You don't if you don't. Here, what's happened is. You still have, and that avoids a case-by-case -case analysis, you simply apply your rule. Here, for the vast, vast majority of prisoners, you still have a case-by-case -case analysis. What you have to justify is having an absolute bar on a, a, a really very small number. And we'll come on to what might be the justification for that in a moment. Um, can I ask you, if we move on, Mr. President, you started this section by saying, if you have a policy and you simply say, I'm, I'm not going to look at these people, that's a fetter on the discretion and unlawful. Yeah. <clears throat> we're, not, we're not dealing here with a policy. We're, I just want to be clear what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a set of prison rules, which are secondary legislation. And it is possible to set it. I mean, rules do this all the time. They say, in order to select, qualify for this, you have to be this, this, and this. Um, th that, that's what rules are. They are, they are lists of criteria you need to satisfy in order to access a particular... Well, well yes, and, and the question is, and this has come up in a number of cases, what is the justification for a, a, an absolute rule rather than one that allows for um, exceptional but, but case? And that, that's what has to be justified. My, my point is, if you're going to have rules at all, rule, rules are rules. I mean, you, you're right within the rule. Of, any rule which says, in, in order to be considered for X, you need to be this, that, and the other, is, is a rule. And, and calling it a, a bright line rule or a blanket rule, I'm not sure I understand that that, that makes any difference. It's, it's a rule. And, and it's in the nature of a rule that you're either in it or out, out of it. 
Manon is absolutely right, but what has to be justified is having a rule here at all. That in 2014, there, before 2014, there was no rule at all. Anyone yes, could be considered for open conditions. What has to be justified is bringing in that rule. But to take my Lord's um, point and apply it to a simple prison scenario where, whereby um, if for 10 days you um, have no reports against you, you're entitled to um, uh, go to the library. Well, that's a simple rule, isn't it? That may be removed remove from certain categories. Of, uh, but it, it's, it's in the nature of rule making, isn't it? Is, is my Lord's point, as I understand it, that um, you have a sort of binary position my lord is right but the question is the position for everyone else and pre-2014 was and this is generally with the these sort of matters such as which prison do you put a prisoner in which category do you put the prisoner in it's generally speaking the prison rules give a very broad discretion what's happened here is you've got an introduction of a rule at all 71a it's not that there were this was one among many rules um, that applied to open conditions and categorisation because it's the only one. If, if one looks at Rule 7, the rest of it simply says it's up to the Secretary of State. What he then did in 2014 is introduce the rule, and that's what has to be justified. Is, uh, and my Lord is right, I suppose once one talks about a rule, it is by definition bright line. The question is, what was the justification of introducing it rather than leaving the position as it was before and having whatever policies you want about exceptional circumstances, etc.? And you'd accept, wouldn't you, the broad authorities which show that since prison management is a, a matter for the prison authorities and the Secretary of State, that's the general context. Absolutely, but 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 but, but I respect this, and that that helps our case because that is the general the general approach. As you say, um, you leave it to the Secretary of State to decide whether to move people to open conditions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is unusual in that to that extent by having a bar on a particular category rather than saying, look. It's a matter of the Secretary of State, who he ch chooses to move, what well, policies he has. Um, and so that's what has Potentially to be... cuts both ways, isn't it? Um, well, the, 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 he did take a decision in this case. Uh, um, I mean, I suppose ultimately, ultimately what the, the question will be, is it justified to have, to introduce that rule in this context? But as my only submission, it's not a context, certainly in terms of categorisation and which prison a prisoner goes to, where there are other rules as far as you're aware the rest is an entirely a discretion why introduce this rule that's what has to be justified um, but, but also in terms of the grounds of appeal the first uh, ground concerns the intensity of review so now on the grounds of appeal the grounds of appeal yes thank you uh, we deal with this in our skeleton at 28 to 51 And essentially the ground is this, that the, the divisional court applied um, what is sometimes known as, or a version of what is sometimes known as the manifestly without reasonable foundation test. It asked itself whether it was manifestly disproportionate, that's the, the final question it asked itself at paragraph 120, to have introduced this rule and concluded that it wasn't. And it did so based on what uh, Lord Justice Leggett, as he then was, had said in SC, where he described the manifesto without reasonable foundation test and equated it to manifestly disproportionate. And that was ultimately the test that was applied. And uh, can I start in, in relation to this ground of appeal with, with three... Um, general points on the applicable principle. Before you do, as I understand it, there's some common ground between um, you and Mr. Watson um, that the divisional court um, appeared to have applied, applied the MWRF test 
it's not something that either side put put before or recommended put that way to the divisional court. Nevertheless, that's the language that was used by the divisional court. There are a plethora of uh, cases, and one only has to admire the scholarship of counsel in threading their way through um, um, both SC, but Clift and Rangelor, and then after this case, Drexler with Lord Justice Singh uh, and Justice Hig Lord Justice Higginbottom and JCWI. Um, appreciate we could spend an enjoyable couple of hours um, um, with rucksacks on going up and down through these um, cases. Um, but speaking for myself, I wonder whether that is a particularly fruitful uh, exercise. But as I understand it, um, Lord Justice Singh um, essentially came up with an amalgam test uh, um, uh, and said that whether you apply the full Monty um, MWRF test um, uh, or you apply um, a different approach of putting everything into the basket ultimately you end up roughly in the same place um, so I don't want to stop you doing any point you want to, but I'll, um, I just wonder how fruitful it would be. Uh, my, 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 Lord, my Lord, I think that is, a, is, is an entirely accurate summary of what, what was said in um, Drexel, which, which which we rely on, um, or, or both parties effectively rely on. It's um, what what that was saying though is not that it doesn't matter whether you apply a manifesto without reasonable foundation or however you want to put it. Because effectively, what manifesto without reasonable foundation is is the broadest. Area, um, area of discretion that can be given to a decision maker. Um, you only interfere if it's manifested without reasonable foundation. Um, what was said in Drexler, and I said you won't go through the, the whole discussion about does it only apply to benefits cases, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because that's that's all now being decided. Um, what was said in Drexler is look, it doesn't matter if you say we're going to apply a conventional proportionality uh, exercise and we ask um, various questions about the nature of the decision, the nature of the rights. Or we say, is this a case where a manifesto without reasonable foundation test is applied? You should get to the same answer because both of them require you to look at a, a series of different questions. To look at everything. To look at everything, but well, but we say there are a number of things that the, the, the courts have identified as being the key, and that and that's what I was actually going to take you to is that the what seems to be the sort of four key um, determinants of whether one uh, applies the broadest ambit of discretion, which is what, area of discretion, which is what the divisional court did, or whether you apply um, um, a close scrutiny, which is what we say is the correct Is approach. close scrutiny different from anxious scrutiny? Um, I, I, I think sometimes the courts prefer it because I, I, it's been said to me, well, the court is always anxious to get the answer right, so I don't, I don't know that it is. They're always <laughs> relaxed and anxious. <laughs> yes, I, think, I, I don't know whether it's different. I think it may be that it's the same. But the, 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 the reason I use those words is that's what comes, what the Strasbourg authorities have said, particularly in relation to these sort of liberty cases. Um, they specifically refer to a close scrutiny um, test. So, so that's, that's so why four, I use that. Four key determinants. Um, four key determinants of this is, um, it, is this a decision in which... Um, the legislature or the executive have greater legitimacy or institutional competence than the courts. We see that particularly in terms of economic and social policy. Is this a decision in which the legislature have greater... Uh, I think you said legislature or executive. Legislature yes, or executive. Or executive right? yes. Have greater legitimacy or institutional competence than the courts. Second is relevant factors, the identity of the decision maker and the nature of the decision making process. And the relevance of that is decision maker, if it is parliament, it is accorded the, the highest level of uh, respect, local authority as a democratic body, um, 
slightly less, but some executive at a lower level. Of course, it is important that the executive is responsible to Parliament. Um, is, are the making of these rules subject to resolutions negative or positive in Parliament? It, it's a negative resolution, but I think in this case they were laid before Parliament but came into force immediately, I think, because they wanted to avoid prisoners finding out that the rules had changed. But these are negative resolutions. And, and do you say that negative resolution means that we're looking at the legislature having an input, or in practice, this is just an executive. Um, in practice, we'd say this is an executive. This is there certainly isn't any suggestion that there was any consideration, uh, and that may be um, perhaps the more important element was the, the second aspect to that, which was the nature of the decision making process. Because if in the decision making process the particular issue before the court has been considered and a decision has been reached, then a greater level of Respect, deference, I know courts don't like that word, but a greater level of uh, uh, um, respect, uh, respect is then accorded. Whereas if the decision maker hasn't considered the particular balance that the court is being asked to strike, it's sometimes said there simply isn't anything to defer to at all. There isn't a decision on the particular question that the court is grappling with. And applying that to this case? Um, our submission will be that there is no suggestion the consideration was given to having an exceptional circumstances carve out here. The assumption seems to have been in all of the documents that ARE, ARE prisoners do not need open conditions because they're going to be removed. There doesn't appear to be any consideration to the harms or benefits of saying, well, why don't we apply an exceptional circumstances test. And this, this will come to the justification for having the bright line rule. So our submission is that wasn't considered. Can it really be suggested that it wasn't considered? Well, this It's what, just your surmise, isn't it? But it's, it's part of the matrix of all of this. Well, if, if one was considering it and one was putting forward a bright line justification, as in a justification for having a bright line rule rather than a case-by-case -case analysis, which you had before, you would expect to find some sort of analysis of what will be the problem with a case-by-case -case analysis, and we don't find any. So there is no evidence or apparent thought given the justification for having a rule. Can I just narrow this one down? It's clear from the papers that what is being relied on is a decision by Mr Grayling in response to a particular person. Is there evidence as to what went in to final process which led to the introduction of this rule? Um, what we've got, I mean, we'll come to that, we, we do, what we don't know is why that case in any sense suggested the rules need to be changed. When we look at it, it seems to be the policy working perfectly properly. Um, what we then have is a series of documents created by civil servants. Yes. Um, and, and it was on that that I made the submission there in the bundle. I think they're attached to... Um, um, Dr. Bennett's statement, yep. and we'll, we'll look at, uh, at at least the summary of them. But what they don't have, we say, is any consideration. The assumption behind them all seems to be these prisoners don't need open conditions, therefore. There doesn't seem to be a consideration, and that's why there doesn't seem to be a... a no consideration of what? Um, of um, the possibility of having an exceptional circumstances carve-out, or no consideration of a possibility of anything other than a bright line rule. So there isn't... So it was the rule or nothing? That appears to be the case. Certainly we, ha we haven't found anything. Well, I'm afraid if you no doubt will shout if I'm wrong. But yes, we haven't found anything which suggested the court was... the Secretary State was considering anything other than the rule or not doing anything at all. And we do say that's relevant to uh, ambit of ambit or margin because it doesn't appear that the issue that we say uh, ought to be considered that, that we put before the court has been considered by the Secretary of State. Um, but, but it's, it's, not, it's not necessary for a decision maker to um, to prove, is it, that every uh, highway and byway of, of Analysis has been gone through. Um, my lord, absolutely. Um, oh, sorry. No, no. It, it is your submission that no consideration, to be clear about this, no consideration was given to uh, 
um, an, an exceptional yeah, group. Yes, it, it certainly doesn't appear from the documents that that was considered. Um, and my it's Lord's your submission that it was not. Yes, it's my submission that it was not. Um, and that's relevant. My Lord is absolutely right. We're not suggesting um, you must consider everything as a matter of, I mean, there may be, that's not the nature of the public law challenge here, but it, come, it's, it is important, we say, to the question of margin deference if something wasn't considered, because you're then not in a position where it's appropriate to say, well, we're only going to fear if manifest without reasonable foundation, because if something hasn't been considered, then, um, and this is the line of case we haven't got, them, but the court may be, you know, the, the, the misbehaving line of case we say, if a decision maker hasn't thought about something, there simply isn't anything to defer to. You, the court, grapples with it. You look at the proportionality. Um, so that's the second factor, the decision, identity of decision making, nature of decision making process, what was considered. Um, third factor, which is the nature of the rights at issue. And this, we say, is the key in this case, because um, uh, I'm a Lord or just having a put, uh, refer to the, the Cliff and Rangelov cases. But what they make clear, we say, is that if you're dealing with liberty, if you're dealing with a liberty case, a decision that makes it harder for someone to achieve their liberty, the Strasbourg Court specifically considered this and said it's a close scrutiny that's needed. Fourth factor is the ground of discrimination. So um, certain categories attract higher levels of scrutiny. They're known as suspect classes, so sex, race, nationality. Others generally speaking, attract lower levels of scrutiny, or at least they won't get scrutiny because of the category. Um, we say there are two caveats to that applicable in this case, because we accept this is not, per se, nationality discrimination. It's about immigration status. But the two caveats are these. Firstly, while the ground of discrimination is routinely referred to by the courts, it's not it appears the weight that's given to it depends on the context, because what we will see in Cliff, in Strasbourg, is Cliff is about as far away as you can get from the suspect category uh, as it's possible to imagine. It's, did, was your descendants more than 15 years or less than 15 years? That was the, the status there. So it's in no sense a suspect category. Or were you more than 15 years versus indeterminate was the other comparator. That's not in any sense a suspect category, yet the Strasbourg Court still made clear it's close scrutiny. Conversely, in the benefits context, there are lots of cases of sex discrimination, an ordinarily suspect category, in which the manifesto without reasonable foundation test has been applied. DA, Humphrey, SC itself, these are all um, sex discrimination cases, and yet the test applies. So that's why I say that was the first caveat. Um, the second caveat, uh, and we'll see this from Rangelo. I'm sure I'm pronouncing wrong. Um, uh, is that while liability for deportation is not nationality discrimination, at least in the prison context in Rangelo, it does seem to be treated as being pretty close to it. Because we'll see the the individual, the applicant in Rangelo, like this case, was unable to access certain, in fact it was day release he was unable to access yes. and, uh, and some measures, because of he was subject to a deportation order, the court no, nevertheless treats it at least as being sufficiently close to nationality. We'll see the line, it says look, if you were German in this case, you could not be subject to a deportation order. So while it's in, it is strictly immigration status, it's sufficiently close to the court that at least want to give it close scrutiny. And we say that may not be surprising in this particular context, because Foreign national prisoners are, as a particular group, we'll see it's Lord Hope refers to unpopular groups um, in, in the A case. It's about, about there, it's about terrorist suspects. But it is those groups that the courts will want to at least carefully ensure that decisions are being taken. If decisions are being taken to disadvantage them, they are properly justified. Um, <clears throat> um, I, I wasn't intending to take you through Drexler. It makes, we say, it supports those 
it supports those points, particularly in um, if one looks at paragraph 78 to uh, 83. Or it might, it might worth actually just, if I could just turn it up, because I think it may help just to make one point uh, based on the authority. I apologise. It's um, tab 15. So this is um, allegation of age discrimination because children with special education needs over 16 um, found it more difficult to obtain paid transport. Children with special education needs. Um, and paragraphs 78 to 83, Lord Justice Singh goes through various of various different criteria or various different pointers, if you like, a number of which I've, uh, I've gone through. And so age is in the suspect category. Secondly, you look at institutional and competence legitimacy. Thirdly, 80 to 81 is that this is something that at least mirrors something that Parliament uh, decided. But then it was just to, to highlight 82 and 83. Because again, this is w one of the points we make, is that he regarded at least as, as important that the policy allowed for exceptions and had an appeal. Which so where are you reading from? Uh, 82 to 83. So you can have an exception. He regards that as important in justifying when assessing the proportionality of the decision. Um, what Drexler doesn't deal with was um, the importance of the rights at issue, um, because Drexler and almost all the cases it refers to are benefits cases, or, or, or something sufficiently close to benefits, various different entitlements. Um, what uh, Clifton Rangelov consider is um, how does the margin apply in liberty cases? Um, so if you're still in the authorities bundle, Cliff, you have a tab 17, and um, the court uh, may well be familiar with with the Cliff litigation. In, in the House of Lords, there were three cases, um, two of which concerned. Uh, foreign nationals liable for deportation and the position was that they couldn't get a recommendation, these were all determinate sentence prisons, they couldn't get a recommendation for release from the parole board because the way the legislation worked at that period was that if you were liable for deportation you couldn't get a recommendation for release. Um, there was also a third case, or I think it was, well, as I said the first case, Mr Clift himself he was um, sentenced to more than 15 years and as a consequence he could get a recommendation for release from the parole board, but it wasn't binding. If he'd been sentenced to less than 15 years or an indeterminate sentence, any recommendation for release would have been binding. And the case is also important for ambit and, and potentially status, but I can deal with that if necessary in reply. But just on margin, you'll see what's said at paragraph 73. I'm sorry, I should have said that the, the, the foreign national prisoners were successful in the House of Lords, uh, Kindari and Headley. Mr. Cliff failed in the House of Lords because he didn't have other status the House of Lords held. He then took his case to Strasbourg. They held he did have other status. And in terms of justification, um, paragraph 73 sets out, sets out the test. And you see it sets out the, the general approach, middle of the paragraph, scope of margin vary according to the circumstances, subject matter and background, generally have a wide margin, economic or social policy, you respect cho policy choices, legislative at least policy choices, unless manifest without reasonable foundation. While in principle a similarly wide margin appreciation applies to questions of prisoners and pe penal policy, the court must nonetheless exercise close scrutiny where there is a complaint that domestic measures have resulted in detention which was arbitrary or unlawful. So that's... And Rangelor was a couple of years later, wasn't it? 2012. Uh, yes. yes, 2012. Um, and what's important about the Cliff case, as I say, is this is in no sense a suspect category. 
nonetheless, you say because you're involved in the concern is about enabling people, enabling people to establish their liberty or in order to enabling people to be free from prison, therefore differences in treatment have to be able to survive close scrutiny. Um, one always right the wrangle of his uh, 2012, so uh, two years later. Um, Rangelov is, we say, very close factually to our case. It may be worth just um, highlighting, if I can just highlight the key paragraphs. Uh, there, what it says, the next tab, paragraph, tab 18, what you'll see is that he's um, what his nationality was. It was a non-German national. He's convicted of burglary, paragraph 9, and, and it looks like a sentence which also involves a preventative element at the end, the end of uh, paragraph 9. He's then subject to an expulsion order, paragraph 10, for about a year and a bit later. And you then see paragraph 11. He can't get what's described as social therapy into, into a, he can't get to a social therapy institution, nor can he get relaxations in the conditions of his detention because of the deportation order. You see that at the end of paragraph 11. And again, paragraph 12, you'll see that the decision is he's not eligible for these things to be moved to a different institution or to have what in effect is his day release because is subject to the expulsion order. Paragraph 87, isn't it? Paragraph 87, precisely, is, is that it's, as is often in the Strasbourg case, you say it's, it's word for word the same as Cliff set. Well, it, it, it quotes, interestingly, it quotes Lord Bingham um, very. We'll, we'll go back to Lord Bingham in, in his original judgment. Um, it reads, doesn't it, in the middle of 87, whilst in principle, a wide margin of appreciation applies in questions of prison and penal policy. The court must nonetheless yes. exercise close, close scrutiny. Yes, I think, my Lord, I think it's citing. It's citing the 73 the ECHR. Yes, yes. So, that we can track back to Lord Bingham as well. Yeah, I mean, it's. Well, I don't know. I mean, it, it's exactly the same line as we saw in Cliff at 73. It's, um, economic policy normally wide margin in principle that applies to penal policy but this is our reading of it you exercise close scrutiny where the complaint of the policy what the complaint is about is something that affects your liberty but, um, I was just looked at looked at that wording there of Wrangel I was a bit puzzled by paragraph 45 of your skeleton um, if we may, forgive me for taking you out of... No, no, no. Order, I, where you... I remind myself what I said. Please. You refer to Rangelov. Um, and you you say that um, a wide margin appreciation was not appropriate, but instead close scrutiny. And I just wonder how that sits with the actual wording of Rangelov. While in principle a wide margin appreciation applies, there must be close scrutiny. Well, it's, 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 it is your summary, paragraph forty-five. I mean, th that's accurate. our submission. What, what, it may what, be your submission, yes. but it's the wording of Wrangler seems to be slightly different. I pause, no, no, yes, I pause. You said that was our, our, our interpretation or, of of Wrangler is what the, what is being said is um, social economic policy normally wide margin. Penal policy would in principle be a wide margin, but our, our reading of nonetheless is, is reading as but. But if you've got, so generally prison and penal policy should also be wide. Our reading is, it, is that in a case it's about liberty, it needs to be close scrutiny. But again, can you help me with the two different concepts. One is you have a wide margin of appreciation in questions of prison and penal policy, um, but you must still exercise close 
close scrutiny as a different concept. Well, my Lord, it, 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 they want a danger sort of reading very, doing very close. Our, our, our understanding is that that's not what the sentence is saying. It's, it's linking to the sentence before, which is um, generally, we read it as generally speaking, in principle, you treat penal policy as socio as like other socio-economic, but... Which previous sentence? The, the previous sentence... Um, oh, I apologise, it's sorry. It actually is... We need to go back to 73 of Cliff. Because this is, I suppose, a, this is a summary of what's said in Cliff. Or a, it's exactly the same line that my Lord is, is taking me to, the final line of 73. It is, it's simply repeated, quoted verbatim in Rangelov. But if one looks at what is being said in Cliff, we say it explains what that line means, which is... The last sentence again reads, while in principle a similar wide margin of appreciation applies in questions of prison, the court must nevertheless exercise close scrutiny. But, but it's exactly the same wording, but we're, we say what you have there is the lines before. What it says is um, social economic policy usually... Don't interfere unless manifested without reasonable foundation. In principle, that should apply to penal policy. But our reading is, but if if that penal policy is about the liberty of an individual, because you have all sorts. It's of not people, a but, is it? It's a, it's a nevertheless. It so, must nevertheless exercise close scrutiny. So there is a what it appears to be saying. There's a similar wide margin, but you've got to look at it jolly closely. And aren't those two different? Well, that, that's why. It, that's why. It, 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 but if it was read in that way, we would say it doesn't really make sense because these are two different concepts. One is why your, your, your submission, Mr. Squires, is that there are two standards of scrutiny. It's either close scrutiny, or it's less close, wide margin scrutiny. Yeah. And they're two different boxes. And normally, you put in this box social and economic things and, and other things where there's institutional competence and deference and so on. But some things go in that box, depending on whether it's a suspect category. And one of the things that appears in that box, according to Rangelov, is where it's submitted with arbitrary or unlawful detention as the result. Is that your yes, submission? That, that's my submission. It's, it's because the reason I say that is because penal policy can be there can be lots of bits of penal policy that have got nothing to do with a person's prospect of getting liberty, contact with their family. There's all sorts of different penal policy that won't be about liberty. But if what you're talking about is discrimination in relation to the ease at which someone can achieve their liberty, which is Rangelov, we say, as my Lord puts it to me, is exactly that, is there are two boxes. And it is saying, while well, penal policy, uh, in principle, could be treated like social economic, when that bit of penal policy is touching on liberty, is our submission, um, then it's close scrutiny, because of the seriousness with which liberty is taken. Yes. As opposed well, I, I... to... I understand the way you put it, but I think my Lord's point was it's not obvious at first sight that they're dealing with the same thing. Close scrutiny is, is how carefully you look, and, and wide margin is once you've looked, what you do with what you find. And 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 uh, that's why I was teasing out what you're really saying, is there are two different ways of looking at it, yeah. and, and it's either in one or the other, and, and you can't be in both. But, but again, that is our submission. Generally speaking, uh, margin of appreciation is regarded as being about level of scrutiny. It's how closely do you look at something to make sure it's justified? Do you say, well, we'll just check that it's not manifested without reasonable foundation. That is the least intrusive measure of scrutiny. You then can have, normally when you talk about close scrutiny, that is in contrast to that. So that, that is our submission of how this ought to and be. And are there any two standards of scrutiny or is there a spectrum whereby the more suspect the closer you look? I mean, how does it work? I, I suspect the answer is, in truth, it may be made overcomplicated. It is a spectrum in the sense that um, you can have all sorts of different factors that may push you in, in different directions. And, and no doubt if this was, and that was the fact we'll see from Rangeloff, because Rangeloff then goes on to talk about nationality requiring a particularly weighty justification. Um, um, and so if, if this is if it's discrimination, if this was discrimination on grounds of, of race or something, you would expect to be even more um, the court would be even more anxious, to use that word, anxious scrutiny, to make sure it was justified. So in that sense, it's on a spectrum. But what we do say is, 
are, are relatively clear is that at the very least wide margin appreciation is different to close scrutiny that's their our reading of that sentence is they're intending to draw a contrast um, and it certainly fits we could look um, in fact, it's set out in our skeleton, but for example, you see that in, I know it's a, a different context, but A, against the Secretary of State, this is the, the Belmarsh detention cases. The particular concern about liberty and why that attracts a greater level of scrutiny than do other forms of decision. And in, in fact, it's also said in A, it's set out in our skeleton, um, it arises particularly because the courts regard as being specialists in questions around liberty, so it also goes to institutional competence. That's it's in our skeleton in quote from Lord Bingham, I think he's referring to a Canadian, uh, Canadian case. So we do say in the context of liberty, when you've got discrimination that makes it harder for some people to be released than others, you do closely scrutinise. It's not appropriate to say, well, we'll just check this isn't manifest without reasonable foundation, and provided it is, the court won't intervene. If we go back to 87 in Rangelor, paragraph 87, we're going to come on to deal with the next sentence, which I was quite interested in. This is very weighty reasons would have to be put forward um, before the court could regard a difference in treatment based, and I emphasize the word exclusively, on the ground of nationality. This isn't a case in which discrimination is based exclusively on nationality, is it? No, no. I, I, nor was nor was Wrangell. I mean, they're, they're both the same. They're, it's based but, on. But your submission appears to be, oh, there must be very weighty reasons. Well, well, well my submission is that, um, provided it's about liberty, and that's why uh, you get you have to have close scrutiny. If you add, and, and that's why Clift has got nothing to do with nationality at this stage or any sort of suspect category. You have to, if you like, and maybe this is um, put to me by Lord, Lord, Lord Nugie, Lord Justice Nugie, that there are, that's why it's on a spectrum, because you can go, you have to have even greater scrutiny, if you like, if you're dealing with both liberty and nationality. And as my Lord says, and if it was exclusively nationality, there's very weighty reasons. Our case and Wrangell, of neither of them are exclusively nationality. But we'll see when we, when we look at the facts, we'll see how the, the, the court. The court then approaches it. Well, can I just get this before we get to the facts? And I don't want to take you off your line, no. all right? We are dealing here with immigration as a status. But are you saying so that I, I got it clear that nationality is also a factor here? Um, yeah, and that, that's certainly our reading of Rangelov. Yes. Because our reading of Rangelov is it is identical to our case. What prevented Mr. Rangelov from social therapy is not his nationality. You saw that from the facts. And we'll see how the court deals with it. It's the fact that he's liable for deportation. So that's why we say it is not nationality. It's certainly not exclusively nationality. But certainly the way the court in Rangelov looks at it is it will want to have a close look at it because it is at least closely tied to nationality. And we, we can see that, in fact, I'm not... not Going back to my, my Lord's point, the back of the question for my lady... Once the court, once the, the court has got out its microscope and taken a very careful look yeah. and found this point, th then logically on the language, one's back to in principle there's a wide margin margin, margin of appreciation. Well, it's, again, our submission that's did, we say that's not the right reading, it, but, did, uh, but that's that's our submission. Is, that is the, there case law explaining how these tools? of margin of appreciation and scrutiny work in practice. Um, can I have a, can we have a think? Uh, you you, you uh, see the problem. But, 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 but not a do. Maybe ask. we're giving this too much close scrutiny, but <laughs> you've asked us to. <laughs> I, I, I have one. No, but our, our, our submission, I, I will have a look at that, but say, our submission is that I, we do say that there are, um, as I say, levels of scrutiny um, which are appropriate. And we do say that uh, uh, what the manifesting without reasonable foundation, the wide, that's the wide margin. And we understand yeah. how you, yeah. how you put it. But, uh, yes, I'm sorry, I'm, not, I'm just um, I will have a look and see if we can help with anything thank you. Um, uh, on this point. Can, um, can I ask you a different question, which is you've accepted that the discrimination, as you have it in this case, is not based on nationality alone, although you say it's, it's a relevant factor. But 
Mr Akbar had been a British national, he would not have been liable for deportation and this wouldn't have applied to him. So, so why, why on that simple basis is it not a question of nationality? Well, I mean, that, that's, um, Rangelov goes close to saying that the reason it's not, strictly speaking, nationality is because there will be other people, he's an Italian national, there will be other Italian nationals who will not be subject to this. Is that the top? So, um, well, that's, it's, it's in a series of cases, um, uh, Brooks, um, these are cases of my learned friend. The, the NDC cases. Uh, yes, exactly, where, where they say, look, it is not, it's, it's immigration status, liable for deportation is immigration status. Um, so it's not, and, and the reason it matters if it's nationality in those cases is because under the Race Relations Act, so Equality Act, but and the equality uh, act, it's direct discrimination. It would be direct discrimination. So you can't justify it. So you can justify exactly. Mm. So that's why those cases the claimants wanted to say it was nationality, and they also brought some EU arguments again, which has to be nationality. So it, it isn't. We accept nationality, strictly speaking, but certainly the way the Strasbourg Court treated it here is sufficiently close to it. And and, and I think the court made precisely the point my lord did, which is that um, it's facts at ninety five in in Rangelo. Unlike German nationals in situation. Yes. So, so it, it, the line before, it says he's, he's subject to an order which he could only be subject to because he's a national, unlike German nationals in his situation. So well, it treats it as being, it makes precisely that point. It says, look, you couldn't have been subject to this. So they're, they're at least again to, for scrutiny purposes, it appears, because that's what this is all related to. They'll treat it as being akin to nationality. But I think we accept, given, I mean, there's, there's binding court appeal authority that says that immigration status in that sense is not, strictly speaking, nationality. We couldn't come along and bring an Equality Act direct discrimination claim because, as I say, he's Italian, there will be other Italian nationals who wouldn't be treated like this because they're not subject to deportation orders, they're not appeal rights exhausted. But what we do rely on this for is it, it's at least close. And so, again, that puts it back in the basket, or it puts it further along. It's not just liberty, but it's also at least connected. Thank you. Um, but also, I see, given the time, I won't take you to A and the Secretary of State. This is the Belmarsh case. But you, you have in our skeleton argument the, the reference to the speeches of um, Lord Bingham and Lord Hope. Uh, and this case is about another area where, again, um, you're pushed. And it may, it may, I said it may, perhaps it may help just to take it up briefly, just given my the Lord of Justice Haddon case question to me, because this does look at the relationship between things that push you in different directions. Um, it's a tab um, three of the authorities' bundle. So this is the post 9 11. Uh, Act of Parliament said a foreign national suspected of terrorism who couldn't be deported, that could be detained. And the issue of margins considered by Lord Bingham and Lord Hope in separate speeches. Lord Bingham, you have at 38 to 39. And of course, it's quite long, but perhaps I can just I can just make some. What is the proposition for which you contend this? Because in cases involving authority for cases involving liberty, the court will give close scrutiny. And that's that's precisely what's at issue there. It's particular top of top of the next page is reference to the Canadian case about. Courts are specialists in the protection of liberty. Again, it goes to institutional competence. And here, the court is saying, look, ordinarily, national security is something we would give. Which paragraphs are you particularly... 38 like? to 39, and Lord Hope, 107 to 108. Mm -hmm. Make similar points. Um, so, so I think just to summarise our submissions on ground one, we say if one goes through the various tests, the most or the most straightforward one is what we are reading certainly of a 
Clift and Wrangle of is that if you're concerned with discrimination that affects people's prospects of liberty, you give close scrutiny. But we also say other factors suggest close scrutiny. One, as I've already submitted, that the issue, the particular question in this case, doesn't seem to be addressed by the decision maker. And we also do rely on Rangelov to say this is, while it's not nationality discrimination, at the very least, one does need to take care to ensure this isn't just the risk, the risk that this is just an unpopular group being targeted, the court needs to make sure, no, there really is a justification for treating them differently. So we do say it was the wrong test applied. What would you ask us to do if we say it was the wrong test? Well, I, I don't think anyone's asking you to remit. I mean, one option would be to remit if you're against us on grounds two and three. But, but our submission is we also say that um, this court is in as good a position to conduct the exercise, and that really is our grounds two and three, is... Um, um, where we say the court went wrong but also link into what we say is the correct answer. We can re reconsider. Uh, the, well, yes, I don't think anyone suggests that. you're right, that, that the divisional court has directed itself, yes. uh, then we look at it afresh. Yes, but with, yes, precisely. Or omit. You were no different, better, no worse position than that there wasn't any oral evidence or anything of that sort. But um, and, and that'll obviously be how one deals with that is our grounds two and three. So turning to ground two, and, and this is the question, the, the, the issue here is, did the divisional court consider properly whether there was a justification for the absolute bar? Did it ask itself what evidence was there that you needed to have a absolute bar or indeed as it switched me a rule, what is the what evidence was put forward by the Secretary of State that you have to have, or it was proportionate to have a rule that operates in that way, as opposed to treating this category of prisoner like any other in which there's a discretion, but with whatever policies you think are appropriate. Um, As I submitted, and as was put to me by my Lord or Justice Haddon Cave, there are all sorts of cases where one has what are described as bright line rules, or, or perhaps simply rules that say, um, if you want to show you're entitled to this benefit, you have to satisfy A, B, and C. Um, and there have been a series of cases that have considered the justification for bright line rules. So for example, um, Tigere, which I don't think you need to turn up, it's in, in tab 10, that's about um, student loans and the way the law operated pre the Supreme Court decision to get um, was um, that if you had if you're a British citizen or had indefinite leave to remain you're entitled to a student loan provided you've satisfied other criteria if a person had um, simply had discretionary leave to remain they weren't entitled to a student loan so it was, a, it was an absolute bright line it was in, legisla in secondary legislation um, and one of the arguments from the um, and, and the justification uh, for that, again, I don't need to turn it up, but it was said that this proves that you're, this helps establish you're part of the community if you've got indefinite leave to remain and you're a citizen and you're more likely to stay in the UK after you finish your university. Now, one of the, the claimants had been in the UK for a long time but only had discretionary leave to remain. And her argument was look, there are going to be people with only discretionary leave to remain who are also tied to the community who really aren't going to leave. And that was accepted, except there would be a minority of people, even though they had only discretionary leave to remain, who would, um, as I say, fulfil ultimately the same purposes as those who had indefinitely leave to remain. They too, like the people who could get the loan, weren't going to go anywhere. Um, and that was accepted, except there were this minority. The, the case turned on, is it justified to have a bright line? even if there will be some people who unfortunately fall on the wrong side of it. And ultimately the issue there revolved around how many tens of thousands of cases we can't operate a case-by-case -case 
decision making process. We can't have some exceptional circumstances, etc. It's just too difficult to administer. That was the dispute, and um, it was accepted by uh, the dissent, Lord Sumption and Lord Reid, that the bright line was justified. The majority said no, it wasn't. There were other ways you could have done this. But the, for our purposes, what's important is that it was what you had to put forward was the justification for having a rule. What the Secretary of State had to show is we couldn't do case by case. We couldn't have an exceptional circumstance. It just wouldn't work we, when you have these sorts of numbers. We have to have a one side, the other side, as I say. The Supreme Court, by three to two, rejected that. But what's striking in our case is that pre-2014, ARE prisoners are considered like any other, as the Divisional Court no doubt rightly said the fact they were ARE would have been a factor to take into account when you do the risk benefit balance but they were treated like any other prisoner and you won't find any evidence at all that that caused any difficulties that caused administrative difficulties it wasted resources it was hard to apply the test to those prisoners And the Secretary of State hasn't produced any evidence since that there will be any administrative difficulty, any resource problems. We'll see why in a moment, because the numbers are tiny. With having, for example, an exceptional circumstances test. Does it have to be a problem? Well, it does in the what, sense what that... What about administrative convenience? The government has to deal with a thousand different issues all the time. If it wants to park one um, in the greater context of government, why, why is that? Why is it not entitled to? Well, what it goes to is ultimately what you're doing is a weighing exercise. You've got the impact on this appellant and a relatively small number of prisoners who will be profoundly affected. On the other hand, what you have to of say course. is what's the benefit? What do we gain by having? this rule. And generally speaking, when one um, justifies having a rule, one says, well, it will be difficult for us. This, this will be the consequence of not having it. Indeed. Looking at, the, for instance, the macro position, just in the curtilage of this topic, but there's the wider departmental issue of running a department <clears throat> that you want to tidy up the edges and try and make bureaucracy slightly simply is there, is the court entitled to look at the the broader picture that this is a tidying up because your submission was just now there's no justification or, or, well, point, yeah no my was right my was right to point out but I suppose my, my submission was what there wasn't was any evidence of administrative inconvenience resource problems suggesting that this was a problem the way it worked before 2014 it might be said, well, the justification is it's simply tidier to have have the rule. Where one would then get to, though, is we would say um, that clearly does not outweigh. Yeah, you um, have your submission. The, it's, 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 it's the weight question. Um, now, we say if there isn't a justification that's put forward of administrative convenience, which in this case there simply wasn't, that simply wasn't the justification put forward by the Secretary of State. And that, in our submission, is fatal to try and justify a rule, a bright line rule, a absolute bar. But we're on your ground too, at the moment. Yes. Is that right? So, Mr. Squire, when I when I read your ground two, I, I'd understood it to be um, a point about the fact the decision maker was divesting him or herself of a particular power, which you. The submission was that um, the effect of doing this um, puts it into a different category yeah, from, yes, from, I mean, yes, from the norm. Uh, you seem to be dealing with a slightly broader point. Yes, I made one. I suppose it's it's a, it's. Are you abandoning no, no, the narrow I, point? It, it is, I suppose it may just be a different way of describing the same phenomenon. Is that what um, by creating this rule, the Secretary of State removed from himself? The discretion in exceptional circumstances. That's the effect of this rule. He gave up the power he had in an appropriate case to move a prisoner to open. So, so our, but, but you referred 
us just now to lack of justification that comes into ground three. No, no, it's, mm -hmm. it's ground. Ask me, it's ground two, which is um, what you have. What had to be justified was the absolute bar, the removing of any power to move prisoners, and um, that has to be justified. And we'll see how the, the, the divisional court dealt with it because they did find refer to a ministry of convenience, and they did refer to people being disappointed. And our, and our submission is those weren't, in fact, there was no evidence of that put forward by the Secretary of State. That was not his justification. The Divisional Court, nonetheless, at paragraph 118, does say, well, um, it, it says there will be resource implications, there will be resource requirements, the Court of Appeals, the Divisional Court said, and they said um, you might raise... You, there's, there'll be a raising of a likely unrealistic expectation of transfer to open conditions. So those were the two. Those would be potentially justifications for the rule. Justifications for removing any discretion. You say, and that, that, is, that is an apparent justification for a bright line rule. Is You accept that, that in a sense, given that the vast majority of um, ARE are going to be deported anyway, the the Shangri-La of category D it is is a bit of a chimera. It's a bit of, um, and therefore, um, let's just remove it because it's very rarely going to happen. Um, is that is that a? Do you accept that's a, a justification of sorts? Um, it might be, but but again, there you would have to think about what the what would be the difficulty of you simply having that in a policy, so that for those who did need. It, you can then move them. What is the? What is the? That's what you've got to put on the scales. But but in fact, in this case, the numbers aren't the numbers aren't so small, at least relative to the the population um, of people who might be considered. It looks like you see in our skeleton. It looks like it's something like um, oh, life as it appears to be about twenty are removed each year under the TERS scheme on average, and. Uh, on average, it looks like about one to two people are refused TERS, and that's uh, each year. So it's, I think it's 11 over a seven-year period. So we may be talking something like 5 to 10%. So it's not numbers that are so minute. You say, this is just never going to happen. Let's just have a rule. It clearly does happen. A and our submission is then the justification has to be the difficulty with saying, well, OK, it's an exceptional circumstance. And there's a second reason why the resource argument, we respectfully say, wouldn't work if it was put forward, is you do have to consider prisoners in any event. You have a sentence planning meeting every year. You do consider whether to transfer them. In this case, one of the things said, said is, what about um, progression regimes? Well, again, you have, to consider, you have to consider whether to transfer a prisoner to that. So you're going to be considering where a prisoner goes in any event. Um, the resource implication of adding to the pre-tariff SIF the question of, well, progression regime or what about open is negligible. Can I, can I understand, because I don't think I have fully understood it. I, I, I've understood what happens if you are transferred to open conditions and then you become eligible to be referred to the parole board and the like. But in Mr Akbar's case, if he's never eligible to be transferred to open conditions, what is his prognosis, as it were? What does he have to look forward to no, he, as matters stand? No, he, he still has to be considered by the parole board at tariff expiry, unless he's unless he's removed. Yes. So all of those, all of that still applies. So at tariff expiry, um, the pro, either the parole board will need to consider his decision, or the Secretary of State will have had to have made a decision to remove him. Or leave him. I mean, I mean, if he, because well, he's within that category where he's not presumed. To be eligible for terms, if if he were, and, and we know, but in his case, he's, there's, there's assessments and so on. But if he were still regarded as a threat, whether to the UK or another country, he would not be removed. Uh, no, but he would be able to go. So he wouldn't be removed under 32A under terms of 97 Act. He would be entitled to go in front of the parole board, and I think the, the parole process should now be starting for him because it's six months yeah. off. He should be considered. Um, so his, tar his tariff expires in September. Yes, so he, he will be considered in any event. For parole, yes. 
and that's why and that's why it's so important to him to be an open condition because it significantly increases the likelihood. But the parole board don't are not going to say in his case, well, since you've not been in open conditions, we're going to assess that you remain a risk. They are going to look at all the the work he's done in closed conditions, yeah. and they will say we don't in your case because we're not allowed to have any assessment of you in open conditions. But they've still got to assess whether he's a risk. Well, absolutely, absolutely. So the, the question is, it makes it harder. He will be in the same position as any other prisoner. Any prisoner can be released directly from closed. But we saw the numbers. It's only 15% yeah. of life as a release because it's that much harder. So my well, lawyer's absolutely right. They may look at the case and say, um, we well, still that, think you're... They're you're bound to look at the case and assess the risk in his case. Yeah. It's just that because of the prison rule, one tool for assessing the risk is not available to them and never will be available. Correct, which, which makes it harder for him to establish that his risk has reduced. That's the issue. But as my Lord has said, because that tool is not available to this particular if prisoner, not by reason of any fault on that prisoner's, um, is the 15% figure really valid? Um, the, there are releases from category C of lifers who have not, for whatever reason, gone into category D open and therefore not been tested, and they are released. Here, presumably the parole board would factor in that the only reason that Mr. Akbar was not in open was because he wasn't allowed to be, even though he has a terrific record. And that's relevant. Is it, it would be relevant to the parole board's consideration. Well, not? No, no, no doubt they would consider that. But what they would also say, and you see, I think Mr. Godala exhibits lots of parole board uh, reports, is that very often what parole board says is that it may well be that it's not a prisoner's fault they didn't manage to spend time in open. And of course, the parole board will say that's not your fault. But but the truth, but the, the position remains the case. They will not have evidence of how he managed to cope when he is released from prison, which is very we've, often we've important. Got, we've got that point. Yes. Is it also... But the, but, sorry to interrupt. I was going to say, but that doesn't mean he's going to stay in prison forever. No. It, it's not as if he can never be released. No, 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 of course not. It's, and it's, uh, in that sense, it's, it's, it's similar to the Rangelov situation where um, he was being considered... It was harder for him to show that his risk had reduced because he had not had day leave, he hadn't had this particular kind of therapy. Um, in, in this case... The hope will be for him that, of course, he will be released in any event in September. But this makes it more difficult, is the because it won't have had. And, and, and we do, but we do say, particularly in um, someone who spent seventeen years in prison uh, on a terrorism offence, um, how he deals with the temptations of ordinary life when he suddenly is confronted by the possibility of having much more freedom is likely to be seen as quite important. But. Um, it, it, it can't be legally determined. The parole board couldn't say we're not going to consider your case. Can we just test your last proposition when you said he, he would hope in September to be released? Being r realistic about this, um, it is equally, if not more likely, that he will be uh, deported. Yeah, yeah, and if he's released, he will then be deported. If yes, the parole board directs, he will then be put on the next plane. He'll be deported. Yeah. yeah. So... It, there's a, in a sense, it might be said that there's an element of unreality about this, this analysis because um, there is a very strong likelihood, whatever the term, that he will be deported. Well, well no, model, because the, the, the Secretary of State could have come into these proceedings and say, look, we've already decided he's going to be deported in September, but they haven't conducted that analysis. And, and the reason we, we respect to say there's no unreality is the submission I made earlier, which is that the parole board and the Secretary of State will be doing the same risk analysis. They're not going to put him on a plane to deport him under Section 32A, this is the Secretary of State, if they think he's still a terrorist threat. Indeed. That The parole board isn't considering exactly the same thing. Indeed, but one must factor in. It's not as if this is his only route out. He has two routes out, um, Secretary of State and parole board. Both of them have to be satisfied his risk has reduced. In reality... In one route is um, to be released and deported. Is it? Yes, well, but, one route is... On tariff expiry, then simply to be deported. Uh, so, yes, there are two routes. 
the parole board says it, it's his risk is reduced under section 28 and gives a direction the, what will then happen in reality is the Home Office will then put him on a plane and deport him. The other route is the Secretary of State for Justice says um, he's no longer a, terror, a sufficient terrorist threat. And he's deported. And, and he's then deported. So it's the same route, but that was my, my earlier submission. Either way, they're going to be asking themselves the same question, which is about risk reduction. Because both of them have to be satisfied there isn't a sufficient terrorist threat. They might approach it slightly differently, but ultimately they're asking the same question about terrorist threat. So for him, that goes back to why, again, open conditions are so important, because that is how you're best able to establish your risk is reduced. Um, so the hope in relation to being released is inexorably attached to deportation. Either way, that is what is going to happen. Once, he, it, Whether it's the parole board or the Secretary of State, the, the Home Office will then put him on a plane and deport him. But either way, that is he's leaving the country. That's he didn't appeal the deportation order. He accepts that. He'll be deported to Italy. But the route, that's why I say it doesn't ultimately matter for him which route he goes down. Well, it doesn't matter for him in practice, but it also doesn't matter in terms of the exercise but the two decision makers will be conducting. I may not have put it very clearly, and forgive me. In looking at the, the rationale for category D open, um, there's a strong po possibility, probability, that he'll be, that these sorts of prisoners will be deported. Okay. And you have to factor that in when looking at the overall picture. Uh, well, to, sorry. It, it, the hope is um, not I'll be released in September and live um, happily ever after in Ashford. No. I mean, the, it's very, very different from that. Well, a happily ever after in Milan, whatever I did in Italy. I mean, that's the that, that's the the will be the consequence. My lord is 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 right that the many of these. So that's why I gave you the figure of five ten percent. Many will be simply deported, but there is the number. The vast majority will be deported. The, the majority will yes. There will be maybe one or two a year who will not be. That's precisely why we say it's an exceptional circumstances case. Is what is the harm, and that's ultimately the balancing exercise, of saying, well, and, and, and because you know very well who they're going to be, at least you know they're not in one of these categories, you can be pretty sure they'll be on the plane, therefore you don't need open conditions. Um, third, I think I was, I was just going through the resource side and say, well, they don't, don't work. One, as I say, the numbers are tiny and um, you need to consider these prisoners anyway. The third, or the third reason that resources in themselves couldn't be. Um, so, uh, just uh, to summarise your arguments, one is numbers tiny. Numbers tiny. Two, Two you're going to have to consider them anyway because you decide you do a sentence review each year, etc. So you're going to be considering what happened to them, progression regime, etc. So you're actually doing this exercise in any event. Three, not only is the not only are the numbers tiny that you'd have to consider, perhaps another 20 a year at the SIFT stage, but the, con the, the resource consequence, if you find one or two are suitable for open, is likely to far dwarf the cost of you having to consider this, because the cost of open is so much less than the cost of closed conditions. If you were really doing a resource, um, a resource analysis, you say, well, how much does it cost us? What's the cost of thinking about these 20 odd cases at the SIFT stage? Versus if we find one or two should be in open, you are saving the figures, I think, are in Mr. Godala's statement, paragraph 47, page 442. You're saving... Um, give us that, those figures we can't uh, the figures quite are, I think, the cost, speed. But... It costs uh, about two and a half... It, it's in 47, paragraph yes, 47, page 442. What's the reference, sorry? Uh, page 442, paragraph 47. It, it, it's just the difference between cap D and all the other categories, and it is, unsurprisingly, significant. So it's a lot cheaper not to lock people up. Yeah. But the difficulty with that argument is that the evidence I sought was that the open state is fully utilised in, in practice parole. So if Mr Akbar doesn't meet the, the open state, another prisoner will. Well, well, we'll come to that because that's under our ground three because the, the position is that in fact the closer state is far more over capacity than the open state. Yes, but, but, but you're not going to move people from overcrowded closed state into overcrowded open state. Have a limited resource on the open state, which is fully utilised, and I don't see.
see myself that it's it's a, an argument that's available to you to say well if we move Mr Akbar to the open state the state will save money because it's cheaper for him to be there because if you don't move him his place place it would be what would be taken by someone else? Well, well, well I'll, I'll come to that in ground three. That isn't the way it works. It's in our respectful submission. It's not. There isn't a limited number of places that operate in that way. That um, um, there was a period, and this is the document I get. I handed up to you in, in twenty eleven, where there were problems of capac over capacity in the open estate, so prisoners weren't getting in who needed to. The position since twenty eleven, or essentially since twenty twelve, has been that isn't a problem at all. Anyone who needs to get to open gets to open. So if you have one more prisoner there, that is not going to change it. Because prisons, the way it works, while there is a capacity figure, the reality is I think it's 60% of closed prisons are over capacity. What you do is, and most open prisons in fact are, you can have an extra prisoner in the prison. So you're not taking a place in any, in, a, in fact, we'll see the evidence, they simply aren't taking places. So that's why I don't say the resource army is the strongest one, but if, one were, if this was a question of just, let's look at the pounds that it costs, that would not be a basis for it. Um, the, the, the Divisional Court's second uh, reason for not having the exceptional circumstances was unrealistic expectations. Um, and um, again, that wasn't something ever raised by the Secretary of State. And again, we respectfully say that cannot justify the absolute bar. You have lots of people who have policies that say only in exceptional circumstances can you be moved. People no doubt are realistic about it. I'm sure would much rather be in a position where they can be considered, albeit they know only exceptionally, than be entirely barred. Um, so that's our ground two. We say particularly if one approaches it with the requisite level of close scrutiny, there isn't evidence to justify the rule, the absolute bar. You could deal with any of your concerns about appropriate people getting to open by an exceptional circumstances category for e even if it's one or two prisoners a year, and as you'd expect from an exceptional circumstances test. Um, Moore's Lady, ground three. Ground three. Um, Ground three is this, if, if one's conducting a proportionality exercise, one has to look at what the aims are, what is it that one's weighing, what is the public benefit or public harm that we're avoiding by this rule, and then weigh that against the impact on, on the individual. And you've already heard my submission that what is not justified, we say, is having the absolute bar. That, that's our ground two. But, but even if one starts to look at the justification generally, for the rule or what lay behind it, we say that doesn't survive close scrutiny. Um, my lady, I think, asked about the, the original impetus for the decision. Well, we, we know the original impetus was, um, I won't ask you to turn it up, it's page 598, and we found the newspaper article about um, someone, it, it was an individual, um, a Barbadian national serving life for murder, um, as in lots of these cases, the family didn't want him transferred to open, the parole board recommended it, and in the end, um, Chris Grayling, then Secretary of State, um, decided not to accept the recommendation. That would seem to be the system working precisely as it is supposed to, and no one, I don't think his decision was challenged. So what is clear is why that should lead, why that should be an impetus to changing the law, nor we say, is there any suggestion of other difficulties pre-2014 which justify changing the law? Normally, if you change something, you think, well, there was a problem. And this is the solution. There is no suggestion. There is no evidence there was any problem to which this was the answer. And in terms of the justifications that, that are put forward, it's easy to see them in the Divisional Court's Judgment, paragraph 40. It is quoting from the witness statement of, of Dr. Bennett. This is uh, page 91 of the core bundle. These are, in fact, four, 
for justifications. But um, one needs to be careful to identify what exactly is the aim that's being pursued. A isn't doesn't set out an aim. It's the general aim of we want to get people out. But that's not an aim. That doesn't explain why one has or what the benefits of Rule 71A. Um, B is an aim, which is valuable but limited resource. C don't require resettlement opportunities, will always be a risk. Just on B, um, category D prisons represent 5%. Is that right of the total yes. prison places? I can't remember what cat A is, but it's... It's about, it's about 5,000 in cat about five, 5, out of 100,000. And then it's cat C is the biggest, I think, isn't it? I can't remember. Yes, I, don't, I, don't, we, I think yeah. there are figures here somewhere. We, we do, um, I'll see if I can find the, the figures. Um, um, so I'll come back to B. C don't require the opportunities and always carry a degree of risk. Well, that we say that can't be a, a justification because for, for Rule 71A, because that is exactly the balancing exercise the Secretary of State always conducts. You look at what's the need, you balance it against the risk. Isn't it more poignant in, in relation to ABE because the appeal rights exhausted, they're going to be deported, um, and therefore, if they're in an open prison, there is said to be more of an incentive to get, go AWOL to avoid deportation. Well, one of the things that we, we put in our... Um, but that's, as I understand, the rationale, at least. For, for that. Well, we, we, one of the things we put in our... Um, well, I said two answers to that. One is, and of course, that is precisely what one... That is exactly the kind of thing, things that one will balance. You, that's in every case. You look at what's the risk, look at all the different... But the the um, point is that in relation to um, the movement to category D status. For somebody who's ABE, um, there is a, a greater incentive to to go AWOL because you, you appeal rights exhausted and you're um, otherwise going to be deported. Um, my, my lord, it it might in principle, but um, the evidence that we presented below, which wasn't disputed, is that actually for, certainly foreign national prisoners as a group are much less likely to abscond than UK, the non-foreign national prisoners. I think the figures, um, it's in our skeleton below, I can dig up the reference, but I think it's something like, the figures look like they're about five times, I think, the, of the prisoners that abscond each year, about um, two and a half percent, I think, of foreign national prisoners. They make up 12% of the prison population, so they're about five times less likely to abscond. I'll, I'll get the references for that. So. It isn't to suggest, so while in theory one can see, one might think there is a greater risk of abscond. In fact, that wasn't the evidence, so that certainly wouldn't have, and these were the figures from 2014, the ones we relied on, the various newspaper articles at the time. Um, so that, we, that isn't the justification that is, or that would not be a good justification. Um, the one that we do deal with, or we deal with under ground three, is the suggestion that is the capacity, the capacity issue, or the, or the argument that, well, um, you are justified in giving a preference to one category, given that it's a limited resource, open conditions. And the first answer we give to that, paragraph 58 of our skeleton, is even if there were concerns about ARE, non-ARE prisoners who were suitable not being able to access open conditions, the answer to that is you run some sort of scheme where you give them, you give preference to the prisoners that you want to, you want in open. It doesn't justify a rule. And what we will see is that, that and that is exactly what happened the only time over the last 10 years, as far as you're aware, that there was a problem of prisoners not being able to get to open conditions who were suitable. And the document I handed up this morning, which you should have at the very back of tab 20, is Annex X. Annex X, 
and xx of um, this again is the same psi we've been looking at. And, and what you'll see is that in the first line is that in 2011, Norms and National Fender Management Service identified that some ISPs were experiencing delays in getting into open conditions. And the reason for it, which is in um, Mr. Gadala's witness statement, um, was the problem of short tariff IPP prisons, which I'm sure the court will be familiar with. This was the, the sentence that became possible after 2005 and was abolished in 2012. But there was a far more, um, these were indeterminate sentences, some of which had very, very short tariffs. And there were far more of these prisoners than um, were expected. That then filters through into a problem of a backlog for open conditions in 2011. And they then set up, you'll see a prior, prioritization criteria, October 2011. And you'll then see that that solved the problem. They, they had to deal with the problem, that lump then. Yeah. Um, does that not give rise to the, the, that from time to time there may be um, delays experienced in people getting to open? And therefore, that's something that could be legislated for or dealt with by the rules um, by limiting the number who would be eligible. Well, well the first um, response to that is a more proportionate response, and um, is this one is that what you do is you then give preference. But the second answer to that, that, my lord, is if you look um, if you look towards the end of uh, the prioritisation criteria, you see this resolved the problem. First, you see the numbers, I and mean, they're they're pretty large numbers. This is just below the hole punch. It's 100 ISPs a year, so well over a thousand are being approved. Once they sorted out this bottleneck, you'll see the end of the paragraph. Um, since October 2012, um, they resolved the problem. It normally takes eight weeks for anyone to be transferred. And you'll see that's that's still the position when they wrote this in 2015, and that remains the position today. Eight weeks is what is the time you would to sort out the administration, work out which prison it is, etc. That's the position if there's no waiting time. And the evidence, and just give you the, the reference to it. In fact, uh, we raised this with the Secretary of State after we received their evidence, and it was confirmed. You have this uh, for, your, for your notes. It's um, page 596, a letter from the Secretary of State on the 17th of September, which confirmed that it remains eight weeks takes roughly eight weeks. It's the same, that is the how long it takes once someone is decided to be suitable to sort out the administration. That, uh, and again, I won't take you to it, but you'll see the evidence from um, Mr. Gadala, the appellant's solicitor, page 437, paragraphs 31 through to 42. He explained the same in, in his experience as a a, 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 a long-standing prison law solicitor, Howard Lee, various others he's spoken to, no one, once this IPP problem was sorted out, now nearly 10 years ago, no one has experienced delays as far as they're aware due to capacity. And so the answer we say is that insofar as the concern was or the justification would be we want to avoid non-ARE prisoners being delayed, that simply wasn't a problem. That's a solution to a problem that didn't exist before 2014, hasn't existed since 2011, 2012, didn't exist in 2014, remains not a problem. And part of the reason we say that in any event, even if there was a problem, this clearly wouldn't be a solution, is that the numbers that are involved, the number of ALPs, is absolutely tiny. We'll see that. Um, uh, again, I'll, just for your reference, when, when the new rule came into force, 21 prisoners were moved back to closed conditions. It's page 604. That's less than half a percent of the open estate. The and rule came, 7 came into effect. 21 prisoners were moved, were moved back. From, from, clo from open back to closed. And if there was a rule... That only, and that there was no exceptional circumstances rule then, but if you did have an exceptional circumstances rule, you'd expect the number to maybe be one or two a year. If, if, you're, if you're saying, well, we're generally not going to move people who are going to be 
deported, or we know are going to be deported, the numbers are then really tiny. That is going to make no difference at all, given the way in which prisoners move around the estate. Um, in terms of anyone who needs to access open conditions doing so. But as I say, that hasn't been a problem since 2011-12. Um, and then there's the further issue, um, which is that the closed estate is in fact far more overcrowded than the open estate. So if one's concern was to manage capacity in the prison system, this rule doesn't make any sense at all. What you would want to have is what happens in all other cases, a general discretion to say, well, where are there problems of capacity? Um, I'll move people. And um, the, the position set out in Mr. Godala's witness statement 34 to 38, page 438, and there's a table. This was um, the most recent table at the time of the divisional courts um, here. And again, I don't think you need to turn it up, but it's, it's 468. It sets out. Um, or maybe it is easy to turn it up, actually, because you can just see it all graphic. Council often say it's no need to turn it up, and then by it. then our appetite has been whetted. Exactly, there we are. <laughs> so we feel entirely free to take us... 468 is the, uh, is the table, and, and Mr Godara explains it in his witness statement, explains which prison's which. And this is May 2019, so this was the one... I don't, we haven't got the up-to-date figures, but the, the position there is that... Paragraph? Uh, this is just, it should be page 468. It should be a table. But if, you, if you have a coloured one, it should be in sort of light and dark green. Um, and this is all the prisons in, in the UK. All the ones above, of Garth and above, are overcrowded. And you'll see the figure on the right hand side. It's 62% of prisons, 72 over, out of 116, were over, the words missing, it's overcrowded. Or over capacity, I think. Overcrowded. If you look, the, the page before used the word overcrowded. So you've got, and of those prisons, of the ones above God that are overcrowded, there's only one that is a purely open prison, which is Huell, you'll note, which is sort of halfway up on the left hand side. And there's another one which is, perhaps wrong, Usk Prescoed which is both open and closed. So what we don't know is whether which bit of it's overcrowded. Otherwise, all of the open prisons, which is another 11, are below Garth. The list is set out in Mr. Godala's statement. So what that means is that the figures end up being about 60% of closed prisons are overcrowded compared to only 15% of open, or it may even be less if one of the, if us fresco, the problem is actually the closed estate. It's actually us, is prescoid actually. Prescoid, sorry, I, was, yes, I'm sorry. I knew I should have. Oh, right. Prescoid, yes, I won't. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I think, um, and I'm not absolutely, but I think that is a prison for particular offenders, sex offenders. Oh, is it? It might, so that may also explain this. I say, all I know from Mr. Godala's statement is that's got both an open and a closed bit, and what we don't know is which bit is. So, uh, the only point we make about this is that um, if one was concerned, generally speaking, with managing capacity, what one would not do, we say, is have a rule that certain people can't be moved from one type of prison to another. What you would do is have the ordinary discretion, and that would be one of the things you'd think about, because otherwise the position is you could have prisoners who are perfectly suitable for open, are in an overcrowded closed prison, who can't be moved to a open lower capacity. Now, as I say, in fact, it may well be that none of this matters because the numbers are so small that, in fact, you're not really going to change any of these large capacity figures. But that all that goes to is our proportionality argument for considering individual cases. M might be said that this table and that this discussion is peculiarly a, a matter of resources for prison authorities and the Secretary of State to move people around as they, they wish. It's, it's a resources issue. Well, precisely, but, that, but well, that, that's exactly our point. If what, if what you're concerned about is best managing the resources of the prison estate as a whole, this is not the answer to, to bar people well, from you, certain, certain prisons. Is not, uh, we're the court, you're a barrister. Yeah. This is not our territory. So this is a, an issue for peculiar for government. That's the sort of prism through which this sort of issue 
But no, I agree. We respect. Might be respect. We say that that helps our, us because what we say is that is um, that is what the position was prior to Rule Seven One A. The Secretary of State can absolutely move anyone he wants in any way he wants. What he has to justify is taking this really very small category out of that, out of his discretion. And we say, if what you're trying to do is find the best way um, to manage your resources, that is not, and if we're doing a proportionality analysis, a good way of doing it. But as I say, my, um, uh, we say one, the, the, the justification in our spectrum fails at the earlier stage, which is, is you're really not going to make any difference at all to other to AR, non-ARE prisoners being able to access open by this rule. But at the same time, it does have a very significant impact, albeit on a relatively, maybe a relatively small number of prisoners. And that, that difficulty could be very, in our respect, for submission resolved by policy. And so it doesn't justify having this kind of impact on, even if it is only one or two prisoners a year. I say that's always the nature of an exceptional circumstances policy. One assumes it is normally one or two who fit into it. That's your case in a nutshell, that is, isn't it? That is a question. Um. I also note the time, but yes, that is that is our our case on justification. Your, your timing is excellent, Mr. Squires. Um, good, thank you. We'll rise now, please, until uh, five past two. Thank you very much. <laughs>